like to Nick Zircone. Uh, Nick is going to give uh, give us an academic point of view, academic and research point of view. I have an advantage. You see, I'm unencumbered with a lot of knowledge of the subject, so I can talk on. And a couple of the things that Dominic uh, brought out, I thought I really should comment on because I like to read newspaper headlines too. And probably the best one I ever saw about healthcare was a few years ago in that venerable old paper, Veritas. You probably know it better as the National Enquirer, but the headline I, I still remember: "New Hope for the Dead." And I thought that was pretty good. I also thought I should tell you, I actually am a computer scientist. I do research in computational linguistics and data mining. Um, I, did, I try to stay out of hospitals because they make me nervous, but <laughs> I did have an experience at Grand River just last weekend. One of, uh, one of my new graduate students from Thailand closed the car door on her thumb, and just to be safe, I wanted to make sure it wasn't broken, I rushed her to emergency, and uh, I found out quite logically that the order in which you're taken in an emergency is the order, not in which you came in, but the order of the severity of the injury. And of course, uh, a smashed finger isn't necessarily as severe as a broken leg or anything. So four hours later, I was thinking we were going to have to break her leg to get her, to get her seen, but, uh, but I understood the, the rationale. Um, okay, I'm going to give you a, a very uh, narrow uh, point of view. I'm not trying to be comprehensive. I have my own views on a lot of these things. For example, most of the focus that people, I think, put on healthcare in terms of automated systems and that, and they touch on the fringes about the things that can be done, but they center around their data and the movement of their data. Give it up. There's no hope. As long as companies like Oracle and Sybase and IBM's DB2 and the service providers like PeopleSoft and SAS, and what's, what's that outfit out of San Diego that's big, especially now in Canada? Yeah. And as long as they're in charge of these things, they're not going to give you the future. They're going to give you what you can pay for now at their leisure, and they're going to involve your people in a lot of work so that you can tailor it for your needs. But most of our needs aren't that dissimilar, so they could have a unique system that you could tailor, but they don't do it that way. Anyhow, I could tell you a little bit about what I think the future would bring in that. But let me give you a few cautions. Much of what I'm going to say, and I'll say quickly, is not unique to the health profession or the health system. Um, and I think since both, both uh, talking about both 9-11, since uh, what happened in September, and also, if you recall last year, all the discussion about dialing 911 and nobody answering, uh, I think you'll find a lot more emphasis on these systems that have to do with other things like security, because I'm, and I'm talking about physical security here, not, not data security. That is a problem, but the physical security at hospitals things that happen on the emergency service vehicles where you try to use wireless devices to communicate and deploy best routes and things like that. Um, water management is a particular question here. And I'm going to take, like I said, an extremely narrow view on what health informatics means. I want to concentrate a little bit on some of the future developments. So challenges. Well, what is known, I'll refer to a couple things that Dominic did last year. They wrote a fairly comprehensive view about health informatics called Pointing the Wave blah, blah, blah. And uh, in this series, the Smarter Health Seminar series, he passed out a white paper earlier in the year about the prescription, blah, blah, blah. And remember the ends of the titles, but it took too long. Uh, I want to think bigger about new technologies and uh, such things as intelligent agent architectures, which are more peer-to-peer -peer and uh, new ways of deploying information systems that might be more responsive to personalization. Uh, Distributed Federated Multimedia Databases. Well, that's a big term, but in fact, that's what people are trying to achieve. And I'll give an example of that. Smart cards were mentioned. Uh, interfaces with multimedia capabilities. You know, 30% of our population is functionally illiterate. I don't know what part of it is uh, cognitively impaired, but they need better interfaces to use systems. 
Well, I mean, Alzheimer's and things like that. It's growing as we're getting older. And you need to have systems that, as our government, rightly so, tries to provide better services through the technology they have, like the Internet. We have to be concerned that there's a large part of our population that can't use the Internet. I'm getting, I'm getting close to being one of those. There's courseware that can be developed, both for people at home, but also patients and things like that. And this falls under what I call the intelligent system solutions for the cognitive impaired. And again, I want to mention security. These are some challenges. They're certainly not comprehensive. Like I said, I'm just taking a slice through the questions that were asked. What are the penalties? Well, the long delays for services. Expensive human delivered services, which I think are really inefficient and probably unnecessary. You have patients ready for out care. You have to have a head nurse or a doctor come and give them a one-hour lecture on how to take care of themselves when they get home. They're a captive audience. They're lying in bed there. You know, you can use computer-assisted instruction in probably better ways than we're using it now. Don't waste the doctor's time. Let them do what a doctor does best. In my four years of being chair here, I did very little of what I do best, what I was trained to do. Instead, I, I held hands. You know, you, have to, you listen to people and things. It's, it's nice to do, but you know, your other skills that you go back to, if you're an academic, get, get a little bit rusty. I think there's excessive testing and probably, more importantly, inadequate analysis on the diagnoses sometimes. I think we can help decision support systems can be used, utilized there. And I think we constantly have to have skills renewal. I'm on my first sabbatical right now in 18 years, and boy, I'm using it well. Uh, not just traveling, but you know, renewing it with, uh, with a lot of uh, colleagues and actually writing some papers and, and reading, reading again. Um, capabilities. Well, um, I lived in Saskatchewan for five years, and you know Saskatchewan prides itself on the health system. They pioneered it in the country, and I think they have reasons to be proud. And when I first got there back in about '93, they uh, were talking about this big new project where they were going to integrate all the databases and come out with a new design, finding out what everybody needs. And I said, Oh no, not again. They spent two years visiting all the health care facilities and the hospitals and talking to people about things. How could they build this system? And, you know, people have their Excel spreadsheets in their office, in their department. They're not going to give that up because they have the information they need right there and they download it somehow from bigger databases. But they went ahead and designed this anyhow and, and after about two years decided, oh, this is too big for us. So they spent a lot of money hiring that company out of San Diego to come up to do it for them. I don't know if it's been deployed yet, but it's at least um, six years later, hopefully. Um, there have been a lot of prototypes built in my area, artificial intelligence, that unfortunately never, never got uh, forthcoming into actual products. Part of that is, I think, human resistance, and that's legitimate. You don't want to go to your doctor and have him punch up a system to give you a diagnosis and then say, oh, I agree with that, without him really putting his value judgment or her value judgment into your, your case. Nonetheless, some of these things were quite sophisticated. Um, Caduceus was a sophisticated system for cardiac patients, and um, one of the leading cardiologists in the U.S. at the time, uh, Dr. Jack Meyer in uh, the University of Pittsburgh, believed that that program actually duplicated his thought processes. But he spent with uh, Harry Popo, a computer scientist, nearly 15 years developing that. Um, the technology is a bit old now, but there are some newer systems. Uh, DX Explained does a lot of different kinds of diagnoses uh, based on clinical trials and laboratory tests and things like that at uh, Harvard University and Mass General. But, you know, I think the, this is a kind of an exciting thing, but it's going to be slow to be accepted because you know, we don't really quite trust machines to do things, even if it's our reasoning that they're, in fact, uh, exploiting strategies. Well, obviously, I think you need collaboration among the stakeholders, and uh, maybe smarter health seminars are, are not a bad idea. But I don't just mean government, universities, and, and uh, uh, industry, but you know, patients. <laughs> we, we should listen to them sometimes. They can tell us what bothers them, and help us design better systems. I think education is a you know, never-ending thing. I'm constantly amazed that as I get older, I seem to have more questions and less answers. When I was about nine years old, I used to lie in my backyard when I was growing up and look at the stars you could see them. And I always wondered how far was far and how big was big. And I was glad I would be grown up in about ten years after that and know those answers. Hmm. It didn't happen. 
I think we don't exploit the cooperative education programs enough. Um, Water has probably the largest in the, uh, in the country, if not the world, and a lot of other universities are picking up on this. And I think this is an excellent way. I'd be in favor of the graduate co-op programs for some of the healthcare problems because I think the nature of those problems are multidisciplinary and could be exploited better by the additional training that graduate students would both bring and get uh, in, in the domains. And of course, you never can have too much R&D. Critical success factors. It was about this point when I looked at those questions and I thought, wow, somebody's been reading Harvard Business Review too long. Sure. No. <laughs> but I think the government needs to play a supportive role. You know, I don't think a directive role, but a supportive role. And I think governments in Canada really are good that way. They're not, you know, I mean, we, we like to jump on them for everything, but in many ways, and I, I think Saskatchewan government primarily epitomized this in, in the time I was there when Romanoff was premier. They really wanted to do good things for people. They just didn't have a tax base or any money, but, but they did try to build uh, some support there. And I think we have to promote health and wellness before people go to see the doctor. I think you know, our system is in danger sometimes of becoming more like Britain's where with free health care, everybody went to the doctor. I think we can promote health and wellness as our granting councils have been doing um, by opening up the Medical Research Council, which is defunct, to the Canadian Institutes for Health Research, three times the money they had last year under the MRC, and people in health now can apply, not just if you have a medical school, I mean, maybe you don't. Um, I think we ought to make better use of adjunct status for the health professions. Um, I don't know why universities are so resistant sometimes to change, but you know, there's a lot of talented people in the world. There's a lot of smart people in the world we don't know about them because they don't communicate it, but there's a lot of talented people in the world. The university kind of means a place where we bring ideas together. Nobody has a lock on this. And we tend to forget that most of our professionals, whether they be in health or business or whatever, actually did go to university at some time. It always pains me when I hear the horror stories of how they think all they got out of the university was five minutes worth of stuff they remember. But And we can condense that and you know, sell it to them a lot more cheaper. But in reality, I have no idea what the critical success factors are. <laughs> so I'm just going to leave that at that. I do think industry and academia uh, have come a long way in about the last 10 to 12 years. And again, it's partly government promoting these things, uh, setting up programs like the Networks of Centers of Excellence where they insist that there be some interaction between uh, these centers and their peer group in industry. And I think that's helped break down a lot of barriers. But I do think they're inextricably intertwined. And I think there should be free movement back and forth. So two-way interns. See, we used the term for health interns. I think that was good. I think people from industry should come and work in academic labs once in a while and vice versa and uh, bring interesting perspectives to both, both problems and, and novel solutions. I think the co-development of programs like our uh, health informatics program and the responsibility for both teaching and funding, lobbying and so on for these programs should be done by both industry and academia. I think there should be extensive use of the co-op programs, especially at the graduate level. Like I said, there's a very narrow view on doing it. The concluding remarks I'll leave for you. <laughs> well, thank you, Nick. One more to go. I'm the director of IS in a mid-sized teaching hospital. And it's about 600 beds. We've got three sites, about 3,600 FTEs. And basically, I'm in the trenches. So everything you've heard so far is my reality. And I'm going to also do what Nick did, and that is give you a very, a very narrow view of uh, my reality. Um, as far as I'm concerned, there's, um, well, we want to be on a different, there's, they're truly in my trench anyways. There's only two kinds of people in the world. Um, 
those that read consumers' reports before buying anything of any significance and those that don't. If, has everybody had a chance to see Consumers Reports magazine? Show of hands. Okay, so Consumers Reports is a wonderful organization. They produce a magazine every month and for $3, and it's in your library, so if you don't have the $3, you can just go get it free there. They review every single product you're likely to buy in the next 12 months or for the rest of your life. Uh, I think there are two kinds of people in the world. Those people who get off their Chesterfields and go to the library and look up under washing machines what the Consumers Reports lab tests tell you about washing machines and those people that don't. Um, I'm not sure how the world breaks down, but the people that do are very information management friendly. They want the evidence, they want the information, and then they want to go out and make some kind of action based on that information. But there's a lot of people that don't go, even though it's in the library or available on your newsstand, and buy it. Four out of five of those people work in healthcare. <laughs> so we're having a challenge around, a cultural challenge, about this whole issue of information management. So I wanted to answer the first question that uh, we were posed about the magnitude of uh, the challenge. The magnitude is very large. Now, I could be uh, very politically incorrect by saying it's generational, but I truly believe that there are some generational issues involved. Your typical physician is a 45 or 55-year-old man or woman. Uh, they went to school 30 years ago. The nature and the uh, development of technology 30 years ago was light years away from what it is today. They're having a challenge uh, to pick up and understand some of these new technologies, so we shouldn't be too surprised that they're finding it difficult and problematic. Uh, and the same can be said for our nursing populations. Well, the cost of uh, failure, there's obviously the, the cost that everybody recognizes uh, right off the top, but I think for me, Sitting in my trench, it's, uh, the big cost is that when we make mistakes, we still have to live with the problem we were trying to solve in the first place. Um, and that's the biggest cost. Because we have a history of buying systems, buying tools, and then not getting the objectives that we hoped we would get out of those implementations. And so we have to live with those problems. And then, of course, being in the trench, if you blow one, it's really tough to get the next one funded. So those are, you know, from, at least from my perspective, a little bit of the, um, uh, the, the challenges that we face. From uh, a practical point of view, uh, what this can mean is if the healthcare organization is uh, gun-shy about information technology, they might not put a PAC system in place. Well, so what? Well, if you're an asthma sufferer and you had a chest x-ray three years ago and you're coming back to see your physician again and we've lost the film or you've lost the film or somebody's lost the film, there's no way for that physician to see what changes have occurred. Um, you may have been reading uh, recently about uh, medication error. Uh, we've had a couple of Ontario-based hospitals that have had very unfortunate situations regarding um, giving somebody the wrong drug and having that person die. Um, there's technology out there that will barcode the medication, barcode the patient, and barcode the administrative person, the nurse. Uh, if your hospital isn't information management friendly and you're a patient in that hospital, then one of the costs is you don't have that technology working for you. Um, other examples? You're in the hospital. I think you use the example of taking your friend there uh, with the sore thumb. The example that we see all the time is you, you're in as an inpatient and you've been asked for a medical history 14 times. Single biggest complaint people have when they go to the hospital is, I just saw a nurse. Why did you have to ask me all those questions again? So these are real costs because there is no electronic patient record. And the impact, of course, on you is that you're kind of concerned when the fourth person comes in and asks you that same issue about allergies. Should I know something that I, I'm not being uh, told? I think if, uh, to answer the next question about the current state of IT, I'm, I'm taking a slightly different look at this. I find that we're very tools focused. Everybody wants to talk about tools. I want a PAC system. I want a medication error system. I need a storage area network or some kind of imaging system. Um, I guess the question that always occurred to me after those conversations was uh, that one. <laughs> so it's really hard to blame the tool. 
So one of the things that we've done at St. Joe's is we, we try to take a slightly different approach and it, this all actually comes together, thank you to my previous presenters because we can talk about pretty much what you've already presented with this one little slide. The challenge in the trench for me is the tools are fine. One tool, another tool, a third, it doesn't really matter. They're all very good tools. They wouldn't be out there in the marketplace if they weren't pretty good. We have sometimes a challenge setting clear objectives to get everybody to buy in on what that objective is and what it means for them. We're very complicated organizations. And you just think about a family. You're sitting down to dinner and you can't get five people to agree on what you want for food. We've got physicians and nurses and nurse practitioners and radiologists and laboratorians, all with different viewpoints, all with different approaches to things. It's really tough to get everybody to sit down at the table and agree, yes, that's what we're going to do, that's how we're going to do it, and we're all going to pitch in. Even if we, and we do that on occasion, but when we get agreement, often we forget about the processes underlying what we just talked about. Because it's one thing to agree that we're going to go in this direction, but often that really means that we have to change the way we do things, and boy, is that tough. We have to, and we, uh, I think you talked about the whole workflow issue. That's just a different iter uh, explanation of workflow is that we have people who are very busy, very stressed, and we're asking them to stop doing what's really comfortable for them to do and do things differently. And you know how difficult that is on an individual basis. We'll multiply it by 1,100 nurses or 400 physicians. And it's very, very challenging. And finally, and we've talked a lot about this, uh, we're, we're constantly battling the resources. Money's Too Tight to Mention is the song that is played on our public address system on a regular basis uh, because we just can't afford to do things. And for those people in the technology business, you know that even with a clear objective and some kind of new policy and, and workflow analysis and a pretty good tool, if you don't have the people, not just to get it running, but to keep it running over time, it's doomed to failure. And then we start the whole vicious cycle again about, boy, we gave you a lot of money three years ago and you put in that new system and guess what? It was a failure. The docs hated you, the nurses hated you, the patients were just out of their mind. So it's just a, a very complicated world uh, in healthcare, in the trenches. But I think that I wanted to at least say that we're making good strides to uh, improve it. One of the things that I really liked about this whole seminar series, thank you very much for putting it on, was it really focused on the resource piece. And Nick's comments earlier about we need more people flipping in and out of actual working healthcare organizations and then coming back to academia is a fabulous idea. We are not, we're so busy we need fresh ideas and fresh blood to come in and say, hey, here's some good evidence that this is something that can make a difference. Have you considered it? Because we're too busy and we're under-resourced, we, we don't bring that in to our organizations typically on a day-to-day -day basis. So that's really important. From a vendor perspective, I mean, leave the vendors alone. They do a good job of making good tools. I can't hold them responsible for my objectives or my processes, and I really can't even hold them responsible for my resources. That's all my issue. But what I do ask them to do is come up with the very best tools that they can. And that's a tough enough uh, road to hoe themselves. So I think the challenge for me as we go through this is that somehow we need to choose the projects wisely to make sure that all those four things are in sync and then we have some uh, very good possibility of success. And when that happens, people get excited. And when people get excited, they're willing to take a little bit more risk. We were talking earlier about the problem with healthcare is that there's no risk reward uh, formula. It's, it's just not there. So it's really tough to get people to stand up and take a chance and do something different and try something new because it's very, very easy not to do anything. Thanks very much. I don't know about everybody here, but I thoroughly enjoy uh, the presentations, very different kinds of people and, and different uh, uh, comments. I'm being right here. Uh
Uh, very interesting presentation, very different styles. It was, it was kind of fun watching it. And even having to throw up those neck was okay. <laughs> what I'd like to do now is give you a chance to ask, to ask people questions and make comments. It's going to be a little shorter time. I'll try to run over a little bit if people don't object. But if you get tired of us, don't hesitate to, uh, uh, to get up and move over. But uh, questions and comments from everybody, two people on the panel. I'm going to do this, I'll give you the microphone. Um, you can ask the question, I'll take a second. Uh, thank you. Uh, I enjoyed all the presentations. I'd like to address this probably to someone who's the closest to primary care. I don't know which one of you would be. Maybe the gentleman in the hat. Uh, as a primary care physician, uh, I wear two hats. I try to treat patients and I also try to provide information for them. However, uh, what we're facing now is a group of very well-educated patients who bring to us inch-thick packets from the internet full of nothing but garbage. 95% and 98% of all the medical information I follow, and I run four websites, 98% uh, of the information on the websites that I go to um, are okay. The problem is the ones the patients go to are not okay. In the medical informatics world, how are we going to uh, interface the patient who comes in armed with garbage and try and get them to realize that it is garbage? There's so much education out there they're not using it. Uh, first of all, I'd like to congratulate you and thank you for being a primary care physician because it is one of those sharp points in our whole medical system today uh, that's feeling mo most of the brunt of what you just described. The technology has provided more information than ever before to the patient, but the patient's by and large pretty unable to to do much with it other than print it off in their printer and bring it into you and in the eight minutes or twelve minutes that you get to actually spend with them they've got an expectation that you're going to somehow address the forty two pages of documentation that they brought in i don't have an answer for you other than it's a education process on the part of the patient and on the part of the physician because if you haven't told them already that you're not going to be able to address all of those things I'm sure that you're probably going to uh, tell them that in the very near future there is no way in our current situation I think primary care reform is trying to address that to say that's education and physicians have, find it, I, in my experience find it difficult to provide education in a day that's organized around providing treatment Thank you. <coughs> run at that. I, I agree with you 100% that the combination of of the money that you spend, the tools and the processes are really where the return on investment comes from, whether it's in the short term or the long term. The problem, though, 
is that most organizations have their own culture around how processes are done and how the utilization of tools are actually embedded into the organization. And most tools can be embedded in flexible ways. Consequently, a lot of work can be done on one set of processes that may or may not be adopted by an organization, and consequently, all the work that was invested in it is a bit for naught. But I'm just saying that as a bit because there are elements of every process that needs to be the same, but I think the important piece is that process and tool together is where the optimization comes from, not one or the other. I don't know whether anyone else has a comment. From a practical I'm sorry, go ahead. From a practical perspective, I can just tell you that workflow is a, um, a very exciting technology for us, but probably the single uh, most problematic technology in a real-life healthcare system. Uh, you know, people are funny. Um, they all like to work different. Uh, what, you go out and you do studies and you get them in rooms and have focus groups and you say, no, no, explain how you want to do this. And they explain it in detail, more detail than we can deal with. And then you build it and then you give it back to them and they go, well, that's not what I wanted to do. And so it's problematic because all the things that we talked about earlier about having very few resources. And it's one of those things that when we look at it, um, we say a lot higher risk with these kind of technologies than maybe some other technologies. It's where we have to go, absolutely. And I'm hoping that the vendor community uh, continues to invest very heavily in it because we need a lot of help in this area. Anybody else want to comment? Uh, this is the best of the seminar, I don't know what you're doing, but I think this was really very good and I want to thank you. Um, I just wonder how much conversation there is between hospitals about protocols on, on information technology. Um, I've had occasion from time to time to be bounced in and have a got emergency board for one reason or another. And every time I'm asked that thing about health information, they're using a different form. And I keep wondering, why don't they go to Diane Durham, maybe, and get the same one? <laughs> How about the sales of technology? Right, again, I think this is just bringing back to the same issue that was mentioned earlier. It's a combination of the technologies and the human practices that go around it. Yeah. Different forums for exactly the same type of procedures in different departments and different institutions. So there's a lot of harmonization that needs to happen at the level of procedures, at the level of uh, similar protocols used in the various institutions to treat the same disease. Uh, and that can take us a long way into uh, being able to have the patient move from one institution to the other and yet being taken care of in the public discussion. Okay, the question was, is, can I just speak? The question is, is there any conversation that goes on? Has there been any conversations? Are there any conversations? Will there be any conversations just at the hospital level to try and resolve these things? I mean, how does, literally, does a director or information technology type say from Owen Sound General Hospital ever get together with somebody from Timmins General Hospital and discuss the event? We, we actually do get together, but I think this truly is a board question. So I'm going to pass it over to my lab. <laughs> oh, don't you love to be the scapegoat? Um, you know, this is to me a largely political and it's governance related question in that most of the organizations have a governance and management structure that surrounds them that is politically like it or not driven to some degree and um, they try to retain their own culture and organization and, put, and wrap their arms around it and want to be different than each other and the chances of two hospitals that are governed separately coming to a total agreement on the sharing of resources and information is a very difficult thing to do and so what you do see is corporations and networks forming 
and they are formed at a governance level and when they do that then they can start to share information across organizations quite easily. If you look in Ontario, uh, Trillium Healthcare, Halton Hills, um, there's quite a number of them that have formed clusters of hospitals together under one governance structure and then it becomes pretty easy as a patient to move around within that corporation. But if you're just talking hospital to hospital, to date, there's been very little discussion in this area. And even if they're aware some idea or some suggestion that had been developed by people from academia and industry getting together and sorting it out, to whom do you take it? If you take it to Trillium or to Halton, um, what does that do for Kingston? Nothing. for Jones? Absolutely nothing. Other, other than a technical solution is available and has been proven. And, that, and, and you know what? That's an important piece. That's important. I can actually do it. I'm sympathetic for what you're asking for. In practice, I would hate to see that come up because of the privacy issues here. I would rather see the patient be the owner of his data or her data on a smart card and be able to release what they need to release if you go from one hospital to another. I couldn't agree with you more, but that's I like how you get that. There, there's a barrier. Yeah. Don just said that, that he feels that human resources are a singular problem. Mm -hmm. Simple dialogue is an equally large problem. When do we start the dialogue? Well, then the other, the other problem I was going to bring up, I guess, more to what the gentleman now said, and that is talk about workflow. There's no one piece of IT for healthcare. There's, I mean, your company started off doing that information. That's information technology. I was talking about expert systems and decision support systems. That's another kind of technology. The thing that I meant for giving outpatient care on a automated system. That's another kind of technology. None of these are going to be produced by one company and none of them will be all that integrated. Um, but you might have better integration among select products that can be shared. Uh, I think that, you know, that's why I said that the companies that are starting to use this is a tough job because they don't really know about, in general, different cultures that want to share that information. And they're not producing any of this just for the health system. And they've been mocking over our academic systems for years as well as others. But those two points, I think, that there is no one IT for healthcare, there's a lot of IT's. The second, the, the idea of um, privacy, I think, is an important issue. It was also too many years ago that they found a lot of Canadian health data on Mass General's computers from an insurance company. How did they get there? And why is it there? But I, I, I think if you have your own data, uh, there can be levels of encoding that allow you to not repeat something from the hospital to another. You just give in your card and tell them the code you can access so much of it. It's spread into your particular condition. So that's all. The technology is there. But maybe the government and politics and other things are there. I'd like any comments or questions around the, around the room. And we're running, really running out of time. And uh, I'll leave it to Shirley to. Uh, it wasn't an answer to your question, but a personal observation. Um, I was very happy to see McDonald's announce a new menu yesterday uh, to address the fact that most people over the age of 12 don't eat there as often. I think that it took them 10 years to figure out that they were losing that audience, but the consumer revolted and McDonald's changed their ways. I think we're seeing a bit of a patient re revolt currently. I think your comments from the primary care perspective are an indication that patients are approaching this whole health care thing differently. And I'm personally um, optimistic that when uh, turmoil comes, that is the first step in actually getting solutions. And I think what we've seen for the last two or three years in Ontario is lots of turmoil. My expectation is we're going to see lots more turmoil. And somehow out of that turmoil, good ideas will come forward, either from academia, from industry, from the healthcare organizations themselves. But it's a positive sign that people are voicing their uh, displeasure with how things are going. Oh, yeah. Who does that leave you with? We're going to have to, unfortunately, uh, close it off. But uh, I, I, two things. Several things I want to ask you, if you could. 
we're interested in any topics you would like to see covered in the next year. We're planning some things ourselves. Could you please email to us, surely anything you'd like to see, any comments that you have. And also, secondly, ways of delivering the seminar series that might be of value. Uh, now, that might increase, for example, the potential of people being able to get here. Um, I thank you for the panelists myself. I, I was very, very pleased with you with the presentations. And uh, uh, we're, we're dealing with issues that are anything but solid, as we can tell from the discussion that uh, was going on here. But uh, things are changing. Uh, in Quebec City, it became clear that uh, uh, a lot is happening in the standards development area, which will affect a lot of this. Uh, it'll be, uh, it's happening at a federal level. And the big point among the standards development people and the standards watching people at, uh, at Quebec City this week was stop talking about it, simply mandate it. We're no longer in a position where we can wait for each institution to adopt something. We need to mandate standards across the institutions. The standards development people are asking for that. They're saying it's time to just make it happen. And that will make a huge difference in the things we've been discussing today. Thank you very much uh, from my side and also to the people who have been here throughout. Many of you have been.